Hey YouTube, I'm sitting out in my garden and as promised, I'm here to give you some tips on growing great tomatoes. It won't take you long to notice that my garden is far from perfect. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, I agree with that. However, um, I was really tempted because I knew I was gonna shoot this video to come down here and pick off all the little lower leaves that had blight and tie everything up and water everything really well so it looked really great. But instead, I decided to go with a more honest approach. I've got 115 tomato plants of all kinds of varieties in this garden. And um, I probably put a little more time into them than a lot of people do. However, I am not babysitting these plants. I have got uh, six kids, a whole herd full of goats, a life, hobbies. Um, and though one of those hobbies is definitely growing tomatoes, it's not the only one. So I would say I maintain these tomato plants maybe just a little bit above what your average person might but by no means am i taking care of these in any sort of way that is unattainable to just the, the average grower i grew tomatoes for the first time probably about 10 years ago in a pot on my front porch um, it was just like a hybrid plant i'd bought at the home center put it in a plastic pot and uh, when the tomatoes came in, which there weren't a whole lot of them, I was pretty disappointed because the flavor wasn't anything exceptional. They tasted a lot like what I was able to get at the store. Fast forward a few years and I visited a farmer's market and whenever we were still living in town and I got a little container of these yellow cherry tomatoes that quite literally changed my life. They were amazing, they were so sweet, they were so good. I went back week after week and bought these tomatoes from this farmer and um, they were sun gold, so it was the kind of little yellow cherries. And then, like later, I decided I'll grow myself, which I got the same variety, I put it in the ground, and mine didn't taste as good. And I thought, what is going on here? I was so wildly disappointed, which that set me on the journey of doing a lot of research and learning how do you grow great tomatoes. So I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the things that I've learned when it comes to growing great tomatoes. However, first I want to cover some basic tomato vocabulary. These are just some things you may already know, but you might not. So I'm just going to go over really quick some terms that you need to know when talking about growing tomatoes. First, let's talk about different sizes of tomatoes. Here we have what we would call a cherry tomato. Probably something that most people are pretty familiar with. But then your same classification are grape types, which just have a little bit more elongated shape. There are current tomatoes, which are teensy tiny little things. And there are pears, which also fall in the classification of a cherry tomato. The next size up from cherry tomatoes are what we call salads or saladettes. These are generally two to four ounce fruits. Um, they're not large enough to be constituted as slicers, but they're definitely more than one bite. There are pastes, which are typically really meaty varieties using for making sauces and pastes. They don't have a lot of seeds or juice. And there are slicers. These are the big tomatoes, often called beefsteaks. Beefsteak actually originated as a tomato variety and you can still buy yellow beefsteak, red beefsteak. But at this point, that's kind of taken on the same thing as like in the South when somebody says, hey, do you want a Coke? They don't actually mean, do you want a Coca-Cola? They mean, do you want any array of carbonated beverage? But it's kind of the same thing with a beefsteak tomato. People say that, but that originated as an actual strand and now it's kind of just taken over to be a word that's used to describe those big meaty slicers that we love so much for tomato sandwiches. There are two other words that come up a lot when you're talking about tomato varieties. That's determinate and indeterminate. Now, what that means essentially is a determinate tomato plant will just keep growing and growing and growing. As you can see, this plant here has reached the top of my trellis, which is quite a bit taller than me. So um, that plant's like seven feet tall. That's an indeterminate tomato variety. A determinate tomato variety is often also called a dwarf. 
and they set a certain and amount of fruit and they don't get real tall you know they only they can get just maybe up to a few feet tall and they stop growing and when they stop flowering they stop setting for fruit it's kind of the same difference between like a bush bean and a pole bean your indeterminate tomatoes are going to need some sort of support and they will keep going and keep producing as long as you continue to give them support and keep them healthy. Whereas a determinate tomato variety generally has a shorter season. It does fine with just maybe a steak. Some of them don't even need any support, but they don't put off the same volume of fruit as you would get from an indeterminate. Now let's talk about that number on your packet that says days, 80 days, 55 days, 65 days. What's it talking about? That that number is actually talking about the days to maturity from when you put your seedling in the garden to when you have fruit. It is not referring to when you put the seed in the ground, it's referring to the seedling in the garden. Now obviously, there's a little bit of error in that because you might put a, you know, three week old seedling in the garden or you might put a plant that's been growing for two months and it's already three feet tall. So it's kind of referring more to like a young, Seedling. We're not talking about really mature plants, then you have to wait 80 days from when you transplant them. Um, I know that I started all of my plants in my greenhouse and they got a pretty slow start around mid-February here in Arkansas. We had a lot of overcast days and I started harvesting my first tomatoes about the second week of June. The cherries came in first and about a week and a half, close to two weeks later, the slicer started to come in. There are a couple terms that you're probably completely familiar with, but you may not be entirely clear on, and that's heirloom and hybrid. So what constitutes an heirloom? An heirloom seed is a plant that has been handed down for generations and generations. They generally have really cool stories, and they've got a history behind them. They're incredible, especially if you love stories. Another wonderful thing is, is they have very consistent flavor. You know what you're gonna get. It's kind of iffy on how old the particular type may be. Uh, there are heirlooms that date back into the 1700s, but there are also heirlooms that were developed by the Heinz Company for tomato sauce, and, you know, 60 or 70 years ago. Some people agree that particular variety has to be at least 50 years old to be considered an heirloom. Some people say it should be 100. That's kind of up on, in the air. Basically what you need to know is that an heirloom tomato variety has been bred through the years and handed down generation after generation and that particular plant has stayed the same. So what's a hybrid? Now, a lot of times we read about hybrids being bad. Now, don't freak out yet, just hear me out. There are definitely some shady things going on in big ag when it comes to hybridization of plants. There's another classification of hybrids and there's one term that makes all the difference, open pollination. You have to understand that by nature, the term hybrid, it just means cross. I can make a hybrid here in my garden by taking a couple of plants and cross pollinating them. And whatever I got from that, that mix of those two heirloom parents, it would be a hybrid. It would be an F1 hybrid. So it's not stabilized. It takes, it takes several generations of, of breeding a plant in order to get a stabilized hybrid. But that's how new varieties are made. Um, every single heirloom in this garden came because either on accident or on purpose, somebody crossed some plants. So when you go shopping for seeds, understand that what you're looking for and that is the most important thing is that you're looking for open pollinated varieties, which means that the seeds can be saved. Therefore, it is a sustainable plant. I have a philosophy when it comes to farming um, and I apply it from everything from tomatoes to my animals, just all across the board, anything that I'm trying to nurture to grow. And it's that if you wanna grow something, learn how it grows without you. You have to understand with tomato plants that the way we grow them, which is to put them in the ground, have one stalk growing out, stake them up, um, that's actually not how tomato plants grow. If you go drop a seed off in you know the, the yard and just let it go. Do you see all these little nubs? That's because tomato plants actually will grow roots from every part of their stalk that touches dirt. Because if you understand, when a plant is growing, its goal is not to make you a delicious tomato sandwich. Its goal is to spread its seed, which means that these plants grow into massive things when allowed to sprawl along the ground, 
but the fruit is almost always worthless by the time it gets to the point that we want to eat it because it's laying there on the ground and so all kinds of critters come and and eat the fruit they take the seed with them leave them in their droppings the tomato plants goal is reached but we don't get any sandwiches out of it so what we do by actually staking a tomato plant making it grow upright so we can pick the fruit at optimum ripeness is completely against nature and that to me is very freeing to understand that means that when things start to go wrong it's just because i'm trying to make that tomato plant do something that it doesn't want to do it's not that i'm a bad gardener so I just have to be on the offensive in learning what it is exactly that that plant needs to grow against nature as effectively as possible. Okay, let's talk about some of the things that can go wrong with your tomato plants. I did tell you that I was gonna be honest about my garden, so I'm gonna show you some things that I see right now that are problems. Um, as you can see, I am shooting a YouTube video instead of freaking out about these things, so clearly I'm not that worried about it. One of the things that you see is leaf curl. Um, this just means your plant is stressed. Um, in this case, my plants need to be watered. Uh, we have had very, very hot days. I did not water yesterday because we had just gotten rain, but I will water in the morning, so I'm I'm not freaking out about it right now some of them are not stressed out but some of them are really starting to show some signs of stress but it's okay there are all kinds of issues that come in the form of wilts and spots um, as you can see here now I really don't have time today to go into this in depth so I will tell you that there is a little bit of that that's gonna be a little bit normal but you always want to keep an eye out for plants that are wilting or showing a lot of spotting because a lot of times you can catch blight early on um, but really there are a lot of pictures online and anytime that I've had stuff like that come up you know I've searched I've looked through it you can't always troubleshoot it but I am going to tell you a couple things that you can do to try to keep your plants healthy one of the very important factors in the health of your tomato plants is spacing um, and the second is pruning. Now, the big thing that tomato plants need is they need to be, um, they need to not be left moist and they need airflow. Which, you know, if you're getting a lot of rain, then a lot of times if there's not airflow, it can harbor a lot of moisture. That's where bacteria comes in and you get sick plants. Um, a wilt or a blight can knock your tomato plants out really fast so airflow is very important last year i planted my plants way too close together and i did not prune them and i lost all my tomato plants pretty early on in the season however you can see this year we've got them spaced out 24 inches apart which is still fairly close together but we have pruned heavily As you can see all the lower branches have been snipped off um, and the, this particular plant is pruned to two main vines here and that has made a world of difference in the health of these plants. Another thing is you do not want to water your tomato plants from overhead um, because of the fact that they are so susceptible to funguses and blights. Um, that is just asking for trouble. Now, obviously it's gonna rain. You want it to rain um, and you can't control that. However, be aware after you get a heavy rain to come out Make sure there's air flu, you know, prune out some branches if you need to, because after the rain is when the blight is the most likely to set in. If you're watering your plants, do it from the bottom. Soaker hoses are your friends with tomatoes. If you're gonna water, come through and water along the bottom of the plant to try to avoid a bunch of water splashing up or coming down from overhead. Mulching is also very important with tomatoes because it keeps water and any sort of, um, you know, splashback from happening. When it does rain or when your plants are being watered, it helps keep, keep this lower area of the plants dry, which is the area that is most susceptible to blight. Lower branches are pretty much always, always going to get sick on a tomato plant. As you can see here, I've got a couple that are hanging down and they're starting to wilt. These are just, it's just pretty typical. Here's a branch that fell. I'll tie that back up. But as you can see, the parts that were hanging down, starting to wilt, wilt, wilt. This is why you see so much of the bottom of my plants is just completely pruned. That is the best way to keep your plants healthy. There's also just the reality that some varieties are just more prone to sickness than others. Um, you learn that after growing them and uh, that's why you end up with favorites. 
brandy wines are actually one of the most popular tomato varieties they have a huge following people love them and they are notoriously hard to keep healthy um, I've got a couple brandy wines down on the end they're already starting to show some blight I might have to pull them out halfway through the season but I like them so I grow them anyway you just tend to learn those things um, some uh, sometimes you can find descriptions when you're buying your seeds people will say you know this was really resilient I didn't get any sickness out of it and the other thing is, is that's also going to vary so much by your climate. I can tell you one of my favorite tomatoes to grow is Dr. Witchy's Yellow. Um, this thing is a beast. It grows big, beautiful fruits. This one's pretty cat faced, which I'll tell you what that means in a second. But I don't deal with a lot of blight in these. I don't deal with a lot of wilt. I really like Dr. Witchy. Another one that I'm growing this year for the first time that I'm really enjoying is called Climbing Triple Crop. If you've been watching my videos for a little while, you've heard me say quite a lot about it. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit of coloring on the leaves where I think it might be getting a little yucky, but so far it's produced so many big healthy fruits that I will continue to grow it again and again like look at this tomato it's massive okay let's talk about a couple of other terms that you might hear or wonder what's going on with your tomatoes whenever you see it okay cat facing now this is something that you see that is very typical of heirlooms and this is caused by faciated blossoms Faciated blossoms are essentially where multiple tomato blossoms have fused together to make one kind of super blossom. Now this can range anywhere from mild, like this one, to extreme where you have 10 blossoms stuck together. But what it results in is cat-faced tomatoes, which essentially is like malformation because of having multiple tomatoes fused together. Now in and of itself it's harmless. You can still eat these. However, these pockets um, where what would have been the inside of the tomato is exposed and hardened, those can harbor rot and a lot of times what you end up with is a really oddly shaped fruit that you have to cut away a lot of your fruit. Probably one of the most disappointing things in tomato growing is seeing a bright red fruit hanging on the vine. Your mouth starts watering. You go pick it and turn it over just to discover it has blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is caused by lack of calcium in your plant. Now, a lot of times that can be a calcium deficiency in the soil, which can be remedied by putting things like eggshells in your soil, but that takes almost a year to break down. Some people suggest putting tums in your soil as a quick calcium fix in case of emergency. I have tried that this year and I seem to be doing better because this is one of the plants that has blossom and rot that did not get tums and most of the ones that did get tums seem to be doing well, but that's still anecdotal. Um, I'm not 100% sure a lot of people argue that the science of that is faulty. Either way, one thing that is agreed upon across the board is that blossom and rot can be caused by by overwatering because it keeps your plant from being able to absorb calcium. So this is another thing that's fixed by moderate, regular watering. I don't have any tomato hornworms to show you because we hunt for ours at night by using a black light, which absolutely does work. However, I can show you here that their damage is pretty um, recognized. Tomato hornworms can wipe out a plant in just a matter of a day or two. You'll come across a plant and you'll see long uh, areas where the branches are just completely stripped of leaves. The black light tip has been a lifesaver for my garden this year. Even though you see here I still have a little bit of hornworm damage because we went a couple of days without diligently checking for them. We have been able to avoid most of um, the crop loss that I ex have experienced in years past because of hornworm. Another issue you may see on your tomatoes is cracking. Um, another thing that can be pretty harmless but can also cost you your fruit because again this exposes the plant to places that may rot and also um, it, it's not beautiful. Sometimes it can cause places that are inedible. A lot of times like in this case it makes for an ugly tomato but it's completely edible because these areas have scabbed over. Cracking is caused by too much water or really more specifically too much water too fast after not enough water. What I'm getting to is that regular watering 
is really important for your tomato plants. Now, sometimes it's going to be out of your control. <laughs> My tomato plants looked awesome until about a week ago when we got a ton of rain all at once. And I'm going to be honest, I wasn't complaining about the rain because I was sick of watering my garden. However, it did mess up my tomatoes a little bit. Most of them are still fine. The thing with tomatoes is, is they actually benefit from being watered every few days really deeply rather than a quick watering every day. If you water deep, it actually allows your plants to grow deeper roots, which makes for stronger plants. And the other thing is, is it helps tremendously when it comes to your flavor. You see, I like to wait until my plants show the first signs of stress from being underwatered, um, just barely leaf curling. Now, I wouldn't want to wait until they were all wilted because then when I watered my plants, I would get some serious cracking in the fruit. However, a little bit of stress is actually not a bad thing when it comes to tomatoes, which brings me to the topic of flavor. excuse the outfit change it's actually the next morning so let's talk about flavor okay let's talk about how we experience taste because that's a pretty important thing to have a baseline for if we're going to start talking about growing for flavor now humans experience taste in one of five ways there's saltiness sweetness sourness bitterness and umami <laughs> that was named and discovered by scientists in Tokyo in 1908 which we would typically say savory that's what umami is that's that experience of savory taste now scientifically what you're experiencing whenever you taste umami is um, glutamates most often which are high in foods like broths smoked fish fermented foods and ripe tomatoes it's actually what is being mimicked whenever MSG is added to food. So ripe tomatoes are one of the highest carriers of umami flavor. Knowing exactly what makes tomatoes taste certain ways means that in your growing practices, you can sometimes play on those things and bring out the positive flavors. However, there are some things about different kinds of tomatoes that are just genetic. For instance, red tomatoes are typically higher in acid. Therefore, this is where you're going to get your more intense and classic tomato-y flavors, reds and pinks. Yellows and oranges, however, they are higher in sugars. And so this is where you get more of your fruity, uh, floral, and very sweet notes. Black tomatoes, which this one's just a little bit underripe, so it looks very green, but even when they are ripe, a lot of times they have very green shoulders. Black tomatoes, things like black creme, Paul Robinson, um, black from Tula, these are higher in umami, so you're going to have much more savory notes. A lot of times people describe them as smoky. Same things with the blue and purple tomatoes that have become popular in recent years. Now, these are colored by the presence of anthocyanins. That's what brings that blue in. Sometimes it shows up in the leaves. The fruits that are exposed to the sun are gonna have more of that coloring. And these are also high in umami flavor. So they are more savory. They're often described as smoky and they have more intense kind of acid than, uh, than rather than sweetness of a sun gold, which would be a small yellow cherry. When it comes to tomato flavor, size absolutely matters. Now on a slicer, you're going to have way more meat to seed pulp and skin ratio. See, inside the pulp and the seed, this is where most of the glutamates are carried in your tomato. That's where our savoriness comes from, but also where most of the saponins are carried. Now, these are soap-like chemicals. It's the reason why some people experience cilantro very differently from others. So, in your cherry tomatoes, that's why a lot of times you bite one and it's like, whoa, that was bitter, or whoa that was really really savory and really really intense that's because there's such a great ratio of the pulp and seeds in this little guy rather than here where there's way more meat therefore way more sugar one thing that you'll be told whenever you start growing tomatoes is nitrogen 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 if you go into the store looking for any sort of tomato specific fertilizer they're typically going to be really high in nitrogen because that does cause plants to grow big and healthy and put off a lot of fruit but the thing is is that if you over nitrogen your plants it does take a hit in the flavor and you end up with a whole lot of fruit that doesn't have the full potential of what its flavor could be 
Molasses is your friend when it comes to fertilizing your tomatoes. Put a few tablespoons into a gallon of water, pour it along the um, soil. You can put it in a spray bottle and spray the leaves, which helps them soak up those nutrients. Has a lot of beneficial minerals and it's high in potassium, which offsets some of the excess nitrogen. You don't give up on nitrogen. Your tomatoes absolutely need it, but add in some molasses and what that does is that raises the lycopene, it helps with the sugars, and it brings you a better flavor to your, to your crop of tomatoes. I mentioned earlier that a little bit of stress is not bad for your plants. Actually, it's very good for your tomatoes to experience a little bit of stress. That's because whenever your plants are under attack or they're in a situation where they uh, go into essentially survival mode, it ramps up the production of certain chemicals. And in a lot of cases, these chemicals are the aromatics, the fragrances, and the flavors that we experience as being positive things. So if you go through and for instance, spray your tomato plants with an aspirin spray, which would be like one aspirin into an eight ounce spray bottle. You dissolve it in there and go through and spray your plants. The salicylic acid that aspirin mimics, it's actually a plant hormone. And what it does is it tricks your plants into believing that they're under attack. And so they ramp up those chemicals to ward off their attacker. But really what they're doing is backing your tomatoes full of amazing flavor. Not only does it bump the flavor, it also bumps the nutrient content. Uh, vitamin C goes up really high and it makes your plants stronger. If they never have any sort of stress, they uh, typically are going to be more weak. However, whenever you mimic this stress, what happens is you have a much stronger plant. And then if your plant actually does get attacked by real bugs, it's got the, the defenses already in place to be able to ward them off. Another huge factor in the flavor of your tomatoes is your watering practices. Unfortunately, overwatering tomatoes completely wrecks their flavor. Um, if you've ever had a big juicy tomato you couldn't wait to bite into and whenever you tasted it, it was just completely watered down and flavorless, it probably came from either too much watering or too much watering recently. The best time to harvest your tomatoes is in the afternoon. The hottest time of the day when those sugars in that tomato are going to be the most concentrated. And please, for the love of all that is tasty, do not put your tomatoes in the refrigerator. They continue to develop the aromatic compounds that cause their flavor for days after they're picked off the vine. In fact, some of their flavors are being evaporated into the air, so they continue to develop those unless you put them in a refrigerator, in which it zaps all of it, and their flavor tanks. Don't refrigerate your tomatoes. They last for a few days on the, on the counter. They do continue to ripen, so you do need to use them, but just use them when they're good, instead of putting them in the refrigerator and making them taste like store tomatoes. I really hope this helps you guys grow the tomatoes of your dreams. Until next time.